As the changes accelerated throughout the decade, steam sheds took on a different appearance. This is Carlisle's famous Kingmore shed, apparently still a hive of activity, with its 8Fs, Britannias and 9Fs all ready for the road. But behind the scenes was a more depressing sight. Rows upon rows of redundant express engines awaiting the scrapman's call. All the famous names were here, from Jubilees to Scots, the march of modernization claiming many victims, witnessed by the yellow stripes on the cab sides, which indicated steam locomotives banned from running under the wires. The wires were the manifestation of the major plank of the 1955 modernization plan, electrification of the West Coast Main Line. The first part was completed at the beginning of our decade, crew to Manchester being switched on in 1960, with the overhead machinery gradually extending to Liverpool, down the main line to Euston, and round the loop through Birmingham by March 1967. All this had a profound effect on the steam locomotive fleet and on the railwaymen themselves. Often forgotten is the way the modernization scheme didn't just eliminate locomotives, stations and railways. Tens of thousands of jobs were to go, with the inevitable loss of morale and pride in the job. Many traditional ranks, such as cleaners, no longer existed, with the result that locomotives quickly became covered in filth. Soot-encrusted steam engines running over lines which would soon be closed or be downgraded to stations without staff were not an attractive way to travel. This all became self-perpetuating as passengers turned away from the dirty railway in ever-increasing numbers, and the vicious spiral continued to gather momentum. The very nature of steam production from coal was conducive to the emission of soot and dirt, and the elimination of all forms of steam power was an objective of government in the 1960s. The railways were just part of this wider field. The massive infrastructure required to support the steam locomotive with its maintenance and running sheds frequently sited in the hearts of towns and cities was a considerable overhead. The closure of sheds such as this one at Rugby would release land which could either be sold off to boost the railway's dwindling funds or convert it into car parks to cater for the changing needs of those customers it could still attract. It was to be a long and hard road, but an inevitable one. The stark fact was that by the 1960s, the steam locomotive was no longer a viable proposition for everyday use. The London Midland region was to be the very last bastion of steam on British railways, its carefully integrated steam fleet being run down through most of the decade. The most notable victims of the electrification were to be the much revered Stania Pacifics, withdrawal of which began with the Princesses in 1961 and 62. The latter year was to see the first Duchesses withdrawn a true indication that the need to eliminate steam had overtaken the original phased replacement of the modernization plan. Had that scheme been followed, the duchesses wouldn't have become redundant until the full electrification from Euston to Crewe had been completed. But a very short-term plan replaced them with diesels from 1962 onwards. All would be gone by 1964, three years early. Black 5, reversing under the wires, takes us to Crewe, the heart of the LNWR and LMS, as well as West Coast electrification. The famous junction was to see the transition from steam to diesel to electric, remaining the hub of the system. The story of many locomotive classes was to end here, and it was the lack of political will and funding that was to result in the last stronghold of steam in Great Britain being the main lines north of Crewe. Although the wires ran north from Crewe to Liverpool, the main line beyond Weaver Junction to Glasgow was deemed too expensive for electrification in the 60s, 
the wires having to wait until the next decade. As a result, many of the LMS standard classes, such as the Jubilees, would see their lives continued until 1968. And this Jubilee is for 5684 Jutland. The application of the yellow cab side strike doesn't appear to have been consistently applied, and many steam engines continued to work under the wires. The Jubilees were the last survivors of the former 5XP class, by now 6P of course. The Patriots having all been withdrawn between 1960 and 1962. The end of steam also saw the end of pre-grouping coaching stock, as BR had built large numbers of standard Mark I coaches, which were more than sufficient in number for remaining services. The rundown of the 8P Pacifics was completed in 1964, when the last of the Duchesses were retired. Surprisingly, none was included in the national collection of significant locomotives, but one, City of Birmingham, went to the museum in its namesake city. The great holiday king, Billy Butlin, had seen the rundown of steam as a source of added attractions for his seaside resort camps. So he purchased two of the redundant duchesses. The attraction waned in later years, and they were made available for display elsewhere, and eventual resale. Thus, by this convoluted route, the gap in the national collection was made good. And the Duchess of Hamilton has become the flagship of the National Railway Museum at York. The first numbered but not first built Black 5 and Royal Scott 460s were to be retained for the collection. It's an interesting coincidence that neither deserves its place by virtue of originality. Both are, of course, valuable in their own right. None of the smaller standards would be retained, although the little class 4 moguls were probably the epitome of the classic British mixed traffic type. The last LMS built Pacific is seen at Preston at the end of her days. Ivat had produced two modified versions of Stania's Great Duchesses in 1947. On their completion, it was announced that they had been built with a view to comparing them directly with the two mainline diesels that were built at the same time. The latter were numbers 10,000 and 10,001, the first British mainline diesels. The result of the contest was never revealed, but by 1964, diesels had ousted the duchesses over Shap. The picturesque Pennines would be amongst the last haunts of the British steam locomotive. The last crabs were withdrawn during 1967, at the end of which steam was eliminated from the main line over Shap. Thereafter, steam was only to be seen on the other routes in Lancashire, as it worked into its final year. As 1968 dawned, 8Fs, a few standards, and perhaps most appropriate of all, a number of Black Fives were left. The work was traditional. There were still plenty of classic short wheelbase wagons, but they would soon follow the locomotives into oblivion. All the Britannias had been transferred to the LMR, and all but one would be withdrawn before the end came, when 70013 Oliver Cromwell headed the last British Railway steam train on the 11th of August, 1968. It then joined the National Collection and went to Bressingham. After that, it seemed the only place for a steam engine was on a plinth. Billy Butlin certainly thought so, although, as we've already related, he would later release them. This Duchess would also end up at Bressingham with Oliver Cromwell. Her companion at air, a Brighton Terrier, came too. For most steam engines, the destination was the scrapyard and oblivion. However, unbeknownst to those who mourned its passing, among the weeds of Woodham's Brothers Scrapyard in Barry, South Wales, there lay the seeds of the great preservation movement of the future, and many more decades of steam. But the Barry miracle wasn't even in the dreams of the 60s enthusiasts. They saw the future in the preservation of a few locomotives direct from BR service. Foremost amongst the active purchasers was Patrick Whitehouse, 
whose railway roundabout programs on the BBC had done so much to record the last days of steam. Together with a group of like-minded friends, he set up the Birmingham Railway Museum at Tysley and purchased the last active Great Western Castle class locomotive, 7029 Clun Castle. From 1965 to 1967, Clun was used on many rail tours, some taking her to places which had never previously seen castles, including Carlisle. Another private purchaser was Lord Lindsay, who bought the last Gresley K4 mogul, the Great Marquis. This also broke much new ground, such as the southern region. One of the most popular public appeals was to save a Gresley A4, and the locomotive chosen was the one which bore his name. But the most famous survivor of all was to be the last steam locomotive to work on British railways. Flying Scotsman was privately preserved by Alan Pegler, direct from service in 1963, with a 10-year agreement allowing her to run over British railways' patterns. Like most of the other preserved engines, she was repainted in her pre-nationalisation livery and was fitted with an extra tender, as water supplies were no longer available. When steam ceased on the 11th of August 1968, BR imposed a complete ban on steam, but Alan Pegg's agreement stood firm. So, at the end of the 60s, Flying Scotsman was the only steam engine allowed on BR main lines. Who would have forecast any more decades of steam?